Please be advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Doing Business Internationally, India. My name is Christy DeMeo Ziegler and I will be your moderator. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our host, Helena Ledick, an Associate General Counsel for CSC in the Chicago office. Helena? Thank you so much, Christy. Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing our subject matter experts for today's webinar on doing business in India. First, um, uh, I would like to introduce the audience to Samir Mittal. He is the Managing Director uh, for CSC in India. Thank you, Helena, for having us. Uh, it's great to be here. Great. And then uh, the other person who will be speaking today is Sakshi Argawal. And Sakshi is the Director and Head of Corporate Services for CSC in India. Thank you so much, Adina, for having me here. Very good. So let me walk us through um, our agenda for today's presentation about doing business in India. We'll start off with about CSC. Then we're going to get into the country profile and why India. Then we'll go into foreign investment in India and we'll cover the two differences, the domestic or foreign status. Sakshi and Samir will take us through that. And then we'll go into some of the technicalities of doing business in India, what to know, and then how CSC can help you. But first, a little bit about CSC. For more than 120 years, CSC has been the partner of choice for companies around the globe. We're trusted to handle everything from incorporating a company through maintaining compliance, corporate transaction work, protecting digital assets from the threats of the online world, and everything in between. We offer the solutions and technology that keep businesses running in the background, allowing our clients to focus on the important work of growing their business. CSC has offices and capabilities in more than 140 jurisdictions across Europe, the Americas, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. We're a global company capable of doing business wherever our clients are, and we accomplish that by employing lo local experts, such as Samir and Sakshi, in every business we serve. Let's get a little bit into the profile of India, though. So as of 2022, the services sector has become the main driver behind India's economic growth over the past few years. It's accounted for 53% of gross value-added growth. The Indian government has worked to improve the ease of doing business in the country and reducing the regulatory compliance burden. India's ranking in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business report has improved from 142nd in 2014 to a dramatic 63rd in 2022. And India is, of course, the second most populous country in the world with a population of 1.4 billion, and that represents a fifth of the world's population. But Samir, what I'd like to do is I'd like to go back to one of our bullet points. And what... Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how the Indian government has reduced the regulatory and compliance burden on businesses? Great question. Uh, so government is spearheading the initiative for reducing compliance burden in India. Historically, uh, you know, we used to get up uh, and we there used to be a new law which has been introduced. But over the last few years in the existing government, more than 39,000 compliances have been reduced as of January 2023 according to the economic survey published for 2023 across various laws. So government is taking key reforms under the company law, goods and service tax, production and corporate taxes, consolidation of public sector banks, enactment of labor codes, foreign direct investment policy reforms, 
Further, the government launched India's national single window system in September 2021 with a focus on helping the foreign investors to have a seamless experience to to form entities in India and and have a minimum compliance burden. So the national single window system launched will provide a single digital platform to investors for approvals and clearances and has generated 4.3 lakh unique visitors as of January 2023 already. Does that answer the your question? Uh yes it does. Very good. Thank you. We want to spotlight uh some of the reasons why India is such an exciting country to invest in. And what we wanted to point out was that um India is the fifth largest economy in the world. Um it ranks only behind the US, China, Japan and Germany and it's projected to grow at 6.7% between 2022 and 2023. And um within the next year or so there's going to be a target of about a US 5 trillion dollar investment in nine key areas including IT, healthcare, energy, financial services and education. Um the goods and services um tax has been reformed and it helps pave the way for a common national market by integrating various indirect taxes. Um there was a bankruptcy code insolvency and bankruptcy code that was introduced which helps businesses resolve those um insolvency issues in a timely manner and there's been quite a lot of digital innovation within India it ranks 46th in the global innovation index in the 2021 rankings the top country in central and southern asia and to me an astounding certific a uh, statistic is that India has the highest fintech adoption rate of 87% compared to the global average rate of 64%. But Samir, I think our audience would want to know a little bit more about the economic and legal reforms. Could you talk a little bit more about the goods and services tax reform and how that has helped the way um paved the way for a common national market? short so india uh, you know we if we go back uh, you know a couple of years ago when the gst was launched so india had multiple taxes like central excise duty for manufacturing service tax for services central sales tax for trading and sales between one state to another state additional duties for customs luxury tax purchase tax entertainment tax entry tax and so and so forth So with the launch of GST in 2017 July uh, all these taxes have got subsumed under GST tax regime and now India has got one tax in form of an indirect tax which is called as GST and India is a union of states and there has been different taxes historically as i said different exemptions different procedures for different states with GST coming into the picture now whole of india has got one tax rate one set of exemptions or you know a similar set of procedures to apply for you know uh, the exemptions and 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 multiple matters uh, and it has made the businesses you know less difficult or it's much easier to operate on all india level now there's a uniform tax rate as i said throughout the country so further even the tax rates between the states historically were different and now all of that have been removed now there is a single rate of tax uh, you know and the more digitalized uh, position as compared to you know more physical that you need to go and apply physically people can now go and you know do the digital uh, applications on the, on the government portal which is uniform all across uh, so there uh, and a seamless input tax credit can be claimed for for the purchases done by the businesses and a, a chain can be followed for that so all these measures have resulted in you know quite a lot of ease for the businessmen and and have reduced in the reduction of the compliance burden obviously it has taken its own sweet time uh, you know to to get it to this level but overall this kind of a major reform uh, you know has reduced quite a lot of burden of dealing with various taxes various consultants and you know and various different procedures and and i think uh, as we progress uh, you know the government is making quite a further steps to uh, to make it more economic and legal reforms more strong and and reduce the, reduce it further like as i said historically national single window system is one such a reform which has helped us very good thank you samir 
there are two types of foreign investment in India. And what the first one is the domestic Indian company. And that's where you're set up as um, uh, the Indian company is set up with foreign direct investment, FDI. The second one is a foreign company. And that's where a foreign entity is doing business in India and it involves the opening of a liaison project or branch office. Now, I have a question for Sakshi here for our audience. Do you always have to open a liaison project or branch office with a foreign company? Uh, well, Elena, uh, well, Elena, in most of the cases, we have to because uh, like uh, these are set up as an unincorporated entity into India. Majorly, when the investors they want to test waters or they have a very specific time based role and. Uh, in these situations, they take a prior approval from a um, reserve bank where um, they are allowed to function in um, one of the three categories, and uh, then they get themselves registered uh, with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs and continue their operations. So in most of the cases, uh, you'll find a foreign company it's working into an unincorporated structure. It would be uh, like one of the three categories. Uh, it would either be a liaison office or a branch office or a project office. Uh, does that answer the question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. So let's now first discuss the entry option one, the domestic Indian company, and some of the, the, the particulars and details around that. So foreign uh, direct investment in the capital of a company is allowed in all sectors outside the prohibited sectors list. And those um, general industries which are banned are gambling, betting, atomic energy, railways, and tobacco. Um, the investment activity can occur through the so-called automatic route where no approval is needed from the Reserve Bank of India. However, in a few instances, it might be required. There's also um, investments can be made from um, countries from around the world but those that happen, um, if your investors come from a country that share a border with India, namely Bangladesh, China, Pakistan, Nepal, Myanmar, Bhutan, and Afghanistan, those require government approval irregardless of the sector or the types of activities. So always those need approval. And then foreign uh, companies can also opt to set up um, wholly owned subsidiaries, joint ventures, SPVs, in the form of public or private companies. So foreign entities can make these investments in equity share capital, compulsory convertible debentures, um, and then preference shares, convertible notes. So I, I do have a couple of questions for Sakshi on this slide. And then uh, when we have over here in the second category, we said that Prior approval is sometimes required with the Reserve Bank of India, even if you're not in one of those prohibited sectors. Can you give us examples of when you might need prior approval? Sure. So what happens is that, that uh, the government of India, under the easy doing business norm, has automated the investments in almost all the sectors in India, except few of the industries or sectors that are considered to be very strategic to the growth of the country. So there are sectors like defense, civil aviation, insurance, then uh, multi-brand retail, uh, e-commerce, railway. Like, uh, these are certain sectors that are considered to be very critical to the growth of the country, and uh, the government has like automated it to a certain extent and uh, has said that, okay, after touching a certain extent, you are required to take a government approval. For example, if we are talking about banking and private sector, so there up to 74% of investment, uh, foreign investment is permitted. But only 49% of that investment is under the automatic route and any investment beyond that 49% to 74% would require a prior government approval. So in a similar fashion, government has um, categorized different uh, kind of uh, sectors and have uh, provided different thresholds up to, uh, uh, and have provided an extent up to which the investment would be allowed under the automatic route for those sectors. Any investment beyond that 
certain grades would go under the government rule. So this is how it works. And as Helena had mentioned, then there are certain countries that show land border with India. In those situations, irrespective of the sector you're working into, you would be required to go to get the government and get a prior approval, and then only you'll be able to function into India. So this so, is how so it works. Actually, that that has me. Uh, that brings up another question for me. If you if you have those investors that do come from a country that shares a land border with India, it, does it matter how many investors are involved, how big, um, or or what percentage? Or as soon as you have anyone that is an investor in any way, you have to get the approval. Yeah, so uh, the beneficial ownership structure, there is a bit of ambiguity around that. That uh, like uh, that is a continuous question that is going on. But yeah, as of now, considering the conservative approach, if the investor happens to be from any of the countries that come into the first note three uh, directions, in those situations, we are required to go to the government and get approval. Okay, very good. Thank you. So let's now talk a little bit about the domestic company requirements for Indian companies. So a private limited company is required to have at least two shareholders, while a public limited company is expected to have at least seven shareholders along with one resident director. Those private limited, limited companies aren't subject to minimum capital requirements. They have limited liability and are separate legal entities governed by the Companies Act. Those profits earned by that invested company can be repatriated in the form of dividends after the payment of applicable taxes without the permission of the RBI. Now, the foreign directors may be required to obtain a permanent account number in India and must apply for a digital certificate signature certificate to enable them to sign various filings with the tax authorities and the registrar of companies. And then, of course, for the KYC, uh, the notarized and apostilled copies, uh, those documents for the foreign shareholders and the foreign directors also need to be notarized and apostilled at the time of incorporation. But I, before we go on, I do have a question over here to ask about uh, those digital signature certificates. So, Samir, can you explain a little bit more about what those are in India? So, basically, as we said earlier, like, you know, all the filings are done digitally for incorporation of companies or even for the annual filings. We need to do all the filings digitally. So, for, uh, for when we do the annual filings or when we do the incorporation of any entity, we need the digital signature to sign, you know, the forms digitally which are filed on the website of Ministry of Corporate Affairs. So digital signature certificates are basically the digital equivalent of one signature. So these are issued by the licensed certifying authorities in India, which are licensed by the government of India to issue such digital signatures. And they are mostly provided in a token or a pen drive format uh, in which we can use them you know, to sign the various forms issued by Ministry of Corporate Affairs for incorporation for various filings. And and uh, you know and and even uh, for tax authorities uh, you know or, or labor law filing whatever it is so these signatures can be used. The process to use these is like we need to register with a specific authority of the proposed director's uh, digital signatures, and ag accordingly we can file do the filings and sign those forms uh, digitally. All right, um, Sakshi, can you tell us a little bit more about the know your customer? supporting information that's needed for foreign directors and shareholders. I know that is very important to our U.S. audiences. Could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. So um, for the foreign directors, uh, the government wants to know like who the director is, uh, like who the director would be, would be uh, like uh, working on, be on the board of the company. So. Uh, they basically require an identity proof that is uh, the passport of uh, the foreign person and uh, that is required to be notarized and apostilled. 
Along with that, as a part of address to the government, uh, usually carers having the, the utility bill or uh, the driver's license, or probably the copy of bank statement, any of uh, these documents that contain the address of uh, the director concerned. And um, in case like uh, the utility bill or the bank statement, these documents are into a language that is not English. In that situation, these are required to be translated. And uh, for the translation, again, like, these documents are required to be notarized and registered. So uh, yeah. this is there for the director's part. And as far as the shareholders or the investors are concerned, in case uh, the investor is a body corporate, in that situation, um, the gov uh, like, uh, we are required to have the notarized and the portion copy of uh, the incorporation certificate of the company, the charter documents, the articles of association, the memorandum of association, the proof of address in the parent company, uh, then a board resolution that uh, has certain prescribed parameters like um, the amount of investment that would be done, the state in which the company would be incorporated, who would be the director, who would be the shareholder. So uh, these are the basic documents that are required from the KYC point of view, and all of these are required to be notarized and posted. And um, then we are also required to have uh, the basic structure of the body corporate or the investor, wherein uh, uh, we usually want to know that um, who is a significant beneficial owner of uh, the company. So uh, this is majorly the document that we require on the KYC front for the foreign directors and the shareholders. All right. Very good. Thank you, Sakshi. We've talked about the domestic companies. Now let's go to entry option to the foreign companies. So instead of incorporating an Indian subsidiary or entering into a specific joint venture, foreign investors may want to set up a foreign company in India after getting the approval from the RBI, the Reserve Bank of India. So registration is required from the registrar of companies or in the form of a liaison office, a branch office, or a project office. And of course, we'll hear about more of those. Let's talk a little bit about liaison offices in India. Foreign companies can set up a liaison office in India to act as a channel of communication between their home office abroad and their operations in India with the aim of promoting and exploring opportunities for the parent company. Samir, why don't you tell us a little bit about the permitted activities for the LOs, the liaison offices, and then what they're not allowed to undertake. So liaison office is actually, you know, more like an extension of non-existing uh, companies, uh, the foreign companies outside India. So the liaison office are being set up primarily to promote the trade or, or increase the collaboration between the parent and the group companies. So, so majorly, if I talk about the permitted activities for liaison offices, they represent the parent company or the group companies in India. They talk and promote the export and import from India and, and do the technical collaborations. They act as a communication channel between the parent company and, uh, and the Indian uh, counterparts and, 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 and do the collaboration. So, so essentially, they are more like, you know, just a representative office uh, with, with no active business, no sales purchase, nothing at all. They will only be doing the activities which increases the visibility or increases the collaboration for the foreign of, uh, for the foreign company in India. And principally, uh, the, the, the activities which are permitted that answer, or which are not activities which are not permitted for, for liaison offices, that liaison offices cannot take any business activity or they cannot do any business activity at all in India, including purchase and sale of goods or providing services, it will morally, may only be incurring expenses, which will be purely funded by the parent company through inward repetitions. So that's, the, that's all about you know, the activities which they can do. Okay, thank you for explaining that. There is also the option of branch offices in India. Foreign companies that are engaged in manufacturing or trading activities are allowed to set up branch offices in India with a specific approval of the Reserve Bank of India. Those BOs, the branch offices, are permitted to represent the parent company and engage in the export and import of goods 
and should be engaged in the same activity as the parent. And they cannot in- undertake any retail trading activities or manufacturing processes. Sakshi, can you take us a little bit deeper into what is permitted for those branch offices? Sure. So, uh, Helena, as you said, that uh, they should primarily be engaged in the same activity as a parent company. So, uh, the branch offices, like once they're set up, they can be engaged in export and imported goods. They can supply professional or consultancy services. Uh, uh, they can carry on research work and uh, promote any technical or financial collaboration. They can buy and sell in India, supply information technology, represent a foreign airline or shipping company. So, uh, like whenever these branch offices they make profits in India, they uh, they can remit the profit outside by paying the requisite taxes in India, and uh, the profits are allowed to be repatriated. So, the only thing that they need to be mindful about is that they are doing the permitted set of activities that are uh, like uh, provided to them into at the time of making the application. So, this is it. All right. Thank you. So let's now talk about project offices in India. Foreign companies that are planning to execute specific projects in India can set up temporary projects and site offices in India for this express purpose. Um, The Reserve Bank of India has granted general permission to foreign entities to set up project offices in India, provided they have secured a contract from an Indian company to execute the project in India and the project has to have secured the necessary regulatory clearances. I've got a question for Sakshi. Um, How difficult is it to set up a project office in India, and uh, will this be denied by the Reserve Bank of India? Would that happen? Uh, Well, uh, to answer this, Elena, uh, there's a separate eligibility norm that the government has prescribed, and uh, like if we fall into that eligibility norm, we can just make an application and uh, the application is processed, but uh, at times the documentation is cumbersome, so like uh, that becomes a bit tedious process for uh, uh, for the investors. But uh, like once uh, we have the documentation in place, the government is normally happy to uh, grant you an approval to move ahead. But uh, like in certain cases, like um, if the government is not satisfied with the bona fides, or like uh, uh, we are doing an activity that um, falls uh, like into the categories like uh, defense, telecom, that uh, the government uh, doesn't uh, like cover under the general permission. In those situations, the application may be denied, or the government might ask you to move your application under the approval route. Otherwise, usually, like, if we satisfy the requisite criteria, the application is made. All right. Very good. Thank you, Sakshi. So now, what do you need to know about doing business in India? And Samir is going to walk us through four different categories. The investment strategy, finding the right local partner, the taxation exchange control um, in corporate and labor laws, and then the nature of activities. Samir? Sure. Thank you, Hanina. Uh, so, you know, uh, while setting up in India, we need to keep in mind that what should be our strategy of investment. So in- investors need to decide, you know, what should be the mode of entry into India, whether they want to do, you know, the wholly owned subsidiary model, whether they want to get into a joint venture or whether they want to get into a franchise model. So for, for deciding that, they need to study the market, target customers, supply chain, distribution cycle, funding requirements, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a lot of things attached to that because India is a, uh, you know, India is a huge consumer centric economy, a lot of opportunity. So from a, while deciding the, stra- you know, strategy on investment, the, the investor should make, you know, an informed decision of understanding the overall market scenarios and the market trend and, and how and where it is going. So finding the local, right local partner. So, uh, so when, if they decide to choose and go through a franchise model or a joint venture model with somebody locally, they need to find out the right local partner, which is extremely important. So maybe, you know, when they, before they decide, they can choose to work with one of the firms who can help them to find out the right local partner if they don't know already. Because, you know, getting the right due diligence done or finding out who, who should be the, the partner in hand who can join, with whom they can join hands, it becomes extremely imperative. 
So another thing to take care is about the laws pertaining to taxation, laws pertaining to exchange control, corporate laws, and labor laws. So uh, when setting up, it is important that uh, the investor looks into the strategy that they how they want to structure the holding uh, uh, of the entity and how they want to structure the shareholding structure. Uh, you know, uh, from from that perspective, and along with that, uh, you know, look into the direct taxes, which includes income tax, withholding tax, inapplicability of the double tax avoidance agreements, transfer pricing. If they are planning to set up it as a cost center and or or maybe on a similar model, uh, you know, and and also the applicability of indirect taxes like GST, uh, you know, and and, um, and 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 export incentive attached to that, um, and on the exchange control as well. Like most of the companies who set up in India, they need to understand that India is, you know, uh, quite uh, uh, regulation based. That we we need to follow the regulations. One of the examples or one of the major problems which companies come across pertaining to exchange control is that they don't have funds in the Indian entity and the entities just under setup and they start paying the bills of the Indian entity from the parent company say in US or any other part of the world which are not allowed under exchange control and it becomes a major issue for the directors of the entity and entity become non-compliant and, and they have to go for a compounding which is a long process. Similarly, on the corporate law, uh, they need to decide on the structure of the entity, what kind of structure, whether it will be a private limited company or a public limited company or a limited liability partnership. There are various options available, and and even uh, you know uh, potentially if they're setting up an entity, there are options that they can also list the securities of the entity as well. And and uh, labor laws, while having the uh, having the manpower on the ground, is is very important because employment laws have to be kept in mind. Uh, you know the laws favors the uh, people on the ground so they need to keep uh, a track about the number of employees the nature of work working hours male to female uh, you know uh, split of employees and and the facilities to be provided display of notices all these things have to be kept in mind uh, at the time of setup as well and and the last thing to decide is the nature of activities and uh, there are a lot of activities that are co covered under spe sector specific laws and require specific licenses like non banking financial sector insurance where in a sector specific rules are required so uh, so uh, while while deciding to set up in india all these things becomes a major part uh, for them to understand and uh, you know and take an informed decision before they can plan to set up now that we've learned about why to invest in india and we've learned about the different types of foreign investments in india and what are some of the details that you need to know? Let's now talk about how CSC can help you. So let's now talk about how CSC can help you in India. Samir, why don't you take us a little bit through this? You can rely on CSC from an end-to-end perspective as a one-stop shop, you know, helping uh, from the formation of entity to, uh, to the entity management. So when you think of Setting up in India, we can help you to take a decision what kind of entity you want to set up, which will and followed by entity formation, domicilization, directorship, shareholders, and then doing the maintenance of the entity from a accounting, tax filing, payroll perspective. We have a full suite of services which we, in which we can also provide you the payroll and HR support in hiring employees and, and doing their offer letters. Uh, along with many other services, which includes tax, asset assurance, uh, fund administration, risk advisory services. So do look at us as an end-to-end -end provider for the services you need in India. So we've heard about what we can offer you in India. Let's talk about CSC solutions globally. So we are the business behind business. As you can see from our solutions listed here, we're the partner of choice for global companies needing expertise in business administration and compliance, fund solutions, transactions and lending, capital markets, and domain security and brand protection. Whatever your company needs to stay in compliance, transact business, and become secure against threats of the online world, CSE can help. 